The views expressed on this program are those of the commenters alone. They do not represent the views or opinions of Valley News Live, our parent company, or our advertisers. I'm here with Professor Bill Ayers. Mr. Ayers, thanks for being with me today. I appreciate your time. Glad to be here. I know you're going to be speaking tonight here at MSUM. What are you going to be talking about? Well, I was asked to talk about, essentially, um, the role of education in and for a democracy. And uh, they gave it a, a slightly more um, lovely title than that. But essentially, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what makes education in a democracy unique, why it's different from education in any other kind of social system, and, and how we can you know, more, more fruitfully um, realize the democratic potential of an educated system. So citizen. what makes it unique in a democracy? Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that you know educators all over the world, whether it's you know Nazi Germany or communist Russia or medieval Saudi Arabia, everybody, including us, wants our kids to show up on time, do their homework, uh, learn the subject matter, be good kids. But there's something different about all those other systems, and that is this: that in a democracy, we take seriously the idea that every human being is of incalculable value, and we try to make an education that's true to that deep, fragile, but profound idea. So we've got incredible dropout rates in this country. What's one of your solutions to, hey, Chris, here's how we can maximize the value out of each student? Well, I mean, one of the simplest ways to put it is that whatever the most privileged and uh, wisest parents have for their children, that's what we should try to organize for all children. Simple example, Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, President Obama and Michelle Obama sent their kids to the University of Chicago Laboratory School. At that school, they had a cap of 15 kids per class. At that school, they had well-resourced classrooms and a respected and unionized teacher corps. They had a curriculum based at least in part on pursuing their own questions to the limit. If that's good enough for those kids, why isn't it good enough for kids on the west side of Chicago? I want to move on. As a, It's no surprise you've got a very controversial past. I want to discuss a little bit about that. I think it's sort of ironic that you're here today, 20 years ago today, the World Trade Center was bombed by terrorists, a group that you, 1993. Today, September. No, 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 it was bombed by oh, terrorists in the oh, basement. Oh, that one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shock. yeah. So uh, a group that you obviously co-founded, the Weather Underground, set off bombs in the Pentagon, the US Capitol, police stations. Speaking of 9-11 uh, back in 2001, that day, a New York Times article came out and you said, and I quote, I don't regret setting bombs. I feel we didn't do enough. It's been almost 12 years since you said that. Do you regret today that you set those bombs off? Not really. Um, and the reason I don't is because the context is, is uh, a little bit hazy or, or, or crazy in the, in the way it's retold. The reality is that I was first arrested opposing the war in Vietnam in 1965 when the American buildup just began. Um, Three years later, even though a majority of people supported the war, three years later, a majority opposed the war. That was a result of anti-war mm -hmm. organizing, of demonstrations, arrests, all the things I participated in. It was a result of people like Martin Luther King coming out forcefully against the war and saying the United States was wrong, immoral, illegal. It was a result of vets coming home and having the courage to tell the truth, including John Kerry, our Secretary of State, who said in front of the <laughs> Senate when he came back from Vietnam, we commit war crimes in Vietnam every day not as a matter of choice, but as a matter of policy. I was opposed to the war. When Lyndon Johnson stepped aside and said he was going to end the war, I was jubilant, as were most of the anti-war activists of my generation. Um, we weren't happy for long. Five days later, King so, was killed. Two months later, Bobby Kennedy was killed. And two months after that, the war escalated again. And here was the problem, Chris. Every week that the war went on, 6,000 people were murdered every week. Every week, two World Trade Centers in Vietnam caused by our government. <clears throat> Even though the United States had lost the war, the killing and the terror went on. The anti-war movement split. One of my brothers ran to Canada. One of my brothers joined the Democratic Party and tried to build a peace wing. I did what I did. I don't claim much for it except to say we never killed or injured anyone. You Sir, could, I want to make correct you. You actually, the bombs you set off or that your organization did, 
killed seven people, three of those being police officers Never. that were innocent civilians. Never. And by the way, the people that were part of your organization killed three people in a home in Greenwich Village. They killed themselves, but there's seven people. That's Where people. did you get that? Yeah, yeah, they killed themselves, that's true, in that accident of bombing. Where is the seven people? I believe from the American Spectator. I don't know what they're referring to because it's not true. We never killed or injured anybody. The, the three sure, you people, killed three people, they killed themselves they making killed themselves. bombs for That's organization. True. That's true, and that was a tragedy, a terrible, terrible tragedy. And 6,000 people were murdered a week by U.S. forces in Vietnam. And so let me share so, this with you. So what we did was to engage in, you could say, we crossed lines of legality, we crossed lines of propriety, you could say we crossed lines of common sense, but it was extreme acts of vandalism and property was destroyed, not people. And your figure of seven people, that's, you got that off the same internet that said that, uh, that um, John Kerry invented the internet or something. I don't know, but that's not true. That's Think about it, I talking about a former vice president, but I do want to move on, obviously, too. So why not just say, look, you know what? Those were bad choices, bad decisions. I apologize for that. And you talked about Martin Luther King. He said nonviolence. Why would two wrongs make a right? Why would you utilize violence to go against war crimes that you're against? Well, sometimes, you know, an act of sabotage is an act of love. Sometimes blowing up a Nazi tank is an act of love. So, you know, and you say, and a king, do you follow King's philosophy yourself? In your I believe life? that we should judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their but skin. But you do follow the King philosophy of direct nonviolent action? See, it's easy to say I'm like King in the sense that I'm not hurting anybody, and that's all true. But you're not actually out there in the streets trying to move the, the, the agenda forward. So why not utilize justice. Mahatma Gandhi's strategy? He stopped a war in India peacefully. That's true. And Mahatma Gandhi, who could, who could dislike him? I mean, exactly. Gandhi, Gandhi was marvelous. He brought the British Empire to its knees. And even though in his time Through he wasn't... Through peace. Like, that, that's true. And Gandhi was the only one of the people you've mentioned so far who was completely consistent. Gandhi was asked what, a question that no Western pacifist has ever answered. He was asked, what about the Jews of Europe? And you know what his response was? They should have lined up and killed themselves in a mass suicide. That's not my philosophy, and I don't think it's yours. No. So you can preach a kind of nonviolence from the safety of your, you know, Sir, excuse your me, chair. let me correct you. I'm not preaching. I'm simply asking you to say, you know what? No, no. Yeah, that was, that was a poor decision on my part, and I regret doing that. No, but the problem is that I don't regret breaking a screaming cry against murder at a time when we couldn't be heard, and our government went forward so with the So do two murder. rights make a wrong? Do two rights make a wrong? Sometimes. Sometimes you have no choice. You're, you're stuck in a reality. So, for example, you would have opposed slavery, I'm sure, right? Majority of people didn't. But if you and I were alive, you know, in the 1840s, we'd have opposed slavery. And it's pretty easy to say now. But what about the slave rebellions? Were they good or bad? The right thing or the wrong thing? They the two were wrongs make a people. right? They weren't going out killing people. They oh, were freeing minute, people to the north. John Brown didn't kill people. Um, in the Civil Harriet War, obviously, Tumman. there were people killed. But again, my here's, point. this is my you're, distinction. You're, you're making, Sir, here's yeah. my distinction. We have elected people to represent us in Congress. A president. They have got a legal right to declare war for this country. We live in a republic. Whether you like that or not, we do. You went out and broke laws that's right. to try and to I, make a point. And I paid the consequence of breaking those laws. So, so you never charged. Parks. I'm sorry. No, that's not true. I was charged and I paid the price for breaking the laws that I broke. When if did you, you have evidence time? of a crime that I committed that you think I ought to be charged with, bring it to somebody. So you're They'll saying it's okay to go blow bombs? I, I, what I'm saying is that we answered in court to all the crimes that we were charged with. We did. So but you were can you look prosecuted? that up, in, not in the American Were you spectrum. prosecuted? We, they dropped the prosecution because they didn't think they could get a conviction. And statute of limitations. So let's not, move. No, it was not statute of limitations. You're absolutely wrong about that. It was not statute of limitations. It's because the FBI had a written plan to do, among other things, kidnap my nephew to force us to turn ourselves in. They couldn't see themselves bringing that in front of an American jury. You think it's okay to kidnap a two-year-old to bring somebody in? Is it okay to... So let me ask you this. Let you me ask you this about, it, about two wrongs making a right. Is it okay, for example, to kill American citizens with a drone? Is that's, that okay? You just read my mind. That's what I was going to ask you. I'm so, asking you. Because but I don't think it is. I don't think it is So either. people now today, because obviously they associate you as a terrorist, I was going to ask you about this. Are you okay with a memo that came out of the president's office that if, even you, if he even thinks you're associated with a terrorist group, that he's got the right to kill you? No, absolutely not. I think okay. that I'm, I'm not a nationalist, and I'm not... And, and the problem with nationalism is that it's blinding. A nationalist thinks that if we do it, it's good, and if somebody else does it, it's bad. If there's a consistent view about terrorism, for example, let's take terrorism since you brought it up. When you say you're known as a terrorist, I 
humbly disagree. You may know that because you read the American Spectator, well, but actually I'm known as many things as you are, not one single thing. And I reject that label. I don't think I was a terrorist. I'm always how asked would you the label question, yourself? I would label myself an educator right now, but and an activist. But here's the thing. You say, if we say terrorism, what is terrorism? And we try to define it, let's do that. So terrorism in, is acts of violence against a, a, a civilian population, against innocents, in an attempt to coerce a certain political, uh, a political decision or a political end point. So John Kerry was right. The United States committed acts of terrorism every day as a matter of policy. John McCain was shot down bombing civilians. He was bombing civilians, that's illegal. You're not actually allowed to do that in the rules of war. So who's the terrorist? Well, we all know there's collateral damage. I'm not saying it's oh, right, please. but again, you're going out there <laughs> making two wrongs, make it right. Here's no, my I don't, you, you keep coming back to that. I don't, I don't buy that. The world is not so neat that you, for example, can just do what you do and call it, I'm not doing anything wrong. If you turn your eyes away from the so rounding I did up not the walk Jews, into the Pentagon and start a group that blew up a bomb in the Pentagon of the U.S. Capitol. Nobody. So for you to sit there and Vandalism. allude to me as being someone that's done something wrong and trying to preach, that is inaccurate. I'm asking you if you regret doing those actions or being a part and of that I'm group. I'm saying those actions I do not regret because I don't regret opposing the war in Vietnam with every ounce of my strength and, and being. But here's another way to say it. If you want me to take full responsibility in an open forum about the things that I did, let's, get a, let's go to the Kodiak Theater, the co whatever it is in Hollywood, and let's put on the stage everybody over 60. And let's have John McCain on that stage, and let's have Bob Kerry on that stage, and John Kerry and George Bush, and right down the line, and me. I'm happy to say everything I did, what I think was wrong, and ask for your forgiveness. But without Kissinger, being held to account. When you have John McCain in this chair, you don't say, but sir, you're a terrorist, and how do you explain two wrongs making a right? But Would sir, you say that same thing There is thing a legal McCain? right in this republic for people to declare war, and there's collateral damage in war. You broke laws by what you were doing. I'm not saying that you have to agree with, hey, no. we went to war. I'm probably with you that, look, let's pull people out of Afghanistan. No, out it was an illegal war, and it was an immoral war. How can it be was, illegal, illegal when it's declared by Congress and the president? It was an illegal war by international How is it illegal law? when it was, it's declared it's by Congress by, and the president? It, by, it's illegal by international law, number one. But, sir, number we have two, a constitution. That's what, what sovereignty is all about in this nation. Two, number two, it was, it was, um, we were lied so into the war in Vietnam. So you're going to dismiss our nation's sovereignty? That, that we were lied into the war in Vietnam just as we were lied into the war in Iraq. That was a lie that got us into Iraq. A series There's a lot of lies. of lies in this nation. Yeah, a lot of lies. All governments lie. You know that. As a reporter, you have to know that all governments lie. The, you know, the good ones, the bad ones, they all lie as a matter of course. Your job in the fourth estate is to uncover those lies. That's what you So here's another one I want to get to then. Sure. At uh, Montclair State University, March 2001, you stated that you wrote the book Dreams of My Father, which has obviously been labeled as Barack Obama's book. Did you write that book? I wrote every word of it, and if you can help me prove it, I'll split the royalties with you. So I know you say that in jest, but in all sincerity. No, in all sincerity, I wrote the book. If you can help me prove it, I'll split the royalties with you. Do you have a manuscript that you'll email me then? I don't have any proof, <laughs> and that's the problem. I want you to prove it with me. That's millions of dollars at stake. You could be So rich. I know you make this a laughing matter, but we're talking about the President of the United States. So huh? what? I mean, so what? The, the, the people you are citing, like the American Spectator? So you just, wait a second. You just mentioned that, hey, this country lies, that we went to war because of a lie, but now you're saying it's okay for Barack Obama, our current president, to lie? Well, wait. You, see, you get your information from the American Spectator. They're the guys who invented this story. It's not the only place to read. You just said to me, Chris, I dismiss the terrorist label. Yeah. I read a lot of different places. Right. So don't coin me as some person that just I, sits I with the American Spectator. I don't want to coin you at all, but, here, but here's the point. The point is, this manufactured idea that I am the, the you know, mysterious man behind Barack Obama has been But I'm proven. giving you a chance to unveil that. Yeah, and I'm making a joke out of it because it's so preposterous and Thank absurd. You. And I'm saying to you, help me prove it, Chris. I, I don't know we how to do be that. Rich together. Last question is the Weather Underground, a self-described communist revolutionary group. Do you consider yourself a communist? No, I mean, you know, I, all my life as an educator, I've rejected labels, but I would say this, when it comes to government, I'm kind of an anarchist. When it comes to the economy, I'm kind of a socialist. When it comes to the First Amendment, I'm an absolutist. And when it comes to the death penalty, I'm an abolitionist. So, you know, there's a lot of things I might call myself. So last night or over the weekend, we had three kids at a hockey tournament. Young white men wear Ku Klux Klan robes. You said you're an absolutist when it comes to the First Amendment. So you're okay with that? They want to wear that? That's I'm okay? I'm an absolutist when it comes to the First Amendment. The way you oppose the kind of racist thinking isn't to outlaw it. It's to educate and to raise consciousness. Anything else you want to share, sir? No.
Thank you so much for your time. Thank this was you, Chris. a great conversation. I appreciate, appreciate it. More coming up. Please be sure and join our conversation. We're going to get a bunch of great feedback right now, but please continue to share your thoughts on that interview. You can go to our website, 630pov.com. Email us, text us at that phone number right there, and or leave us a voicemail message. You can always Twitter us as well. Again, I pose the question that we started the show off with. What's the purpose of higher ed? Tonight, that gentleman you just heard from is going to be standing in front of three to 400 potentially young leaders of America, the future of America, and planting those seeds in their minds. What do I mean by those seeds specifically? Well, just to recap a couple of highlights from the interview. Number one, a gentleman that goes and plants bombs, his organization in the Pentagon and the U.S. Capitol refers to those things as extreme acts of vandalism. Like this dude just pulled out some, I don't know, spray paint and started spray painting the Brooklyn Bridge. You've also got an act of sabotage is an act of love. I don't know what book that guy's reading, but it's definitely not the Bible, I can tell you that. He refers to himself as an educator, and he says illegal against international law. You know what? I hate it when those Democrats hate that thing called the Constitution and sovereignty, but apparently that's where they're coming from. Stay with us. Much more coming up. If you haven't heard the latest about American Crystal Sugar, we've got it for you right now on 630 Point of View. We'll break that down. And again, please join our conversation by going to our website, 630pov.com.